On his path from 8th place All-American to national champion in just a couple years, Roman Bravo Young has been through some ups and downs and faced some tough adversity that he's found ways to power through. I invited wrestling YouTuber True Tan Wrestling to help explain Roman Bravo Young's career from start to where we are now. So let's stop stalling and start talking wrestling. Roman Bravo Young, or known as RBY by most Penn State fans and wrestling fans alike. He's a pivotal member of the Penn State lineup and a saw 133 being the returning national champ this season and looking impressive trying to repeat himself this year with no blemishes in the losing column. He is on his senior season, but due to last year's eligibility rules, he could return for a fifth season, no questions asked. However, how did Penn State land such an impressive recruit? And once they land him, why they start him as true freshman year? Yes, you heard me right, he has never redshirted in his amazing college career. And the most impressive part of that aspect is that he took 8th as a true freshman nationally to become an All-American. And then simply two years later, he became the national champ with a lot of COVID adversity thrown into that two-year gap. RBY is a stud and he always has been, but I think people forget he had a very up and down true freshman year. So how exactly did RBY place 8th and then climb his way all the way up to the very top of the All-American stand? Well, let's talk about it. First things first though, I am sure you are all wondering, but hey everyone, my name is Tanner and this is True Tan Wrestling. Oh, whoopsie, here, uh, let me just edit that out real quick. Alright, let's try that again. Hey everyone, my name is Tanner and welcome to this Fanco video all about the Penn State 133 Roman Bravo Young and how he climbed up the All-American stand from an 8th place finisher all the way up to a national champion. RBY was always on recruiter's radar, being a stud in high school, no surprise there, but there was one odd thing about him. He was from Arizona, and I don't want to dig in Arizona wrestling, they just aren't as well known as the Pennsylvania, Illinois, New Jersey, or Ohio guys. But even though they aren't as deep, per se, as some of those states, they still produce some massive studs, especially in freestyle, and they are on a real come up right now in high school wrestling. RBY went to top Arizona school, Sunnyside High School, and had an impressive 182-0, that's right, 182-0 record, being a four-time state champ, along with winning Fargo and multiple other massive freestyle events to get his name on the map. He would commit to top school Penn State, which was a great get for them at the time after graduating All-American Conway, which left a minor hole for the Nittany Lions for a year or so. Entering into college, many people wondered how his top game would be like since they mostly only saw him in freestyle, and how would he evolve from a high school wrestler into a college wrestler. However, Penn State needed him to go right away regardless, but would he be ready to go, and how well would he look? Well, his debut went without saying, he looked amazing. Penn State would wrestle Kent State, and he would score quick and lock up a mean bar to pin longtime national qualifier for the Flash's Tim Rooney, who gave Austin Asano a close match just a few days prior. This one match alone answered every single question surrounding RBY. For one, yes, he can ride tough and score on top, so that thought quickly left people's minds, and yes, he can compete with some of the top tier guys at this weight class. After this first win, he was electric for the Nittany Lions, going on a huge winning streak all the way to Southern Scuffle, which is like the midpoint of the season. He was also all over ESPN after he did a backflip to get out of a single leg during his Lehigh Patesville victory. I have people who have never even really watched wrestling sending me this, asking if I saw it, and telling me how cool it was. However, RBY would have a semi-shaky Southern Scuffle his first year. He made the semifinals, but after a scary close sudden victory win over Girardi of Virginia Tech, who was in redshirt at the time, who was not a bad wrestler by any means, but it was just a little out of character for RBY. Then the following morning, he would take his first L to Austin Gomez, back when he was at 133 and well at Iowa State. RBY was actually winning this match when Gomez locked up double unders, jacked him up, and pinned him in the semifinals, which was super unfortunate to watch. RBY would wrestle back this tournament, but it sort of told us where he was at in the pecking order, and I know everyone wanted to see him battle Fix in the finals of the Southern Scuffle, but we'd have to wait a few years to see that match play out. Then RBY entered the Big Ten schedule, and unfortunately he would take another loss throughout that season to produce star Thornton in the middle of January. But he would bounce back to win a massive match, being returning All-American for the Ohio State Buckeyes' Luke Pletcher, 2-1 in sudden victory, which was not only a nice win for seeding, obviously, but huge for RBY's confidence and growth. However, entering the Big Ten tournament, this match would get opened up, with Pletcher getting the win in the quarterfinals of the Big Ten tournament, but RBY would finish 5th in a pretty loaded 133 Big Ten field. 
field. This tournament also started the rivalry between DeSano and RBY, with DeSano getting the best of him in a 13-8 victory in the Kazi semis. And his first NCAA CB marked in at the 10 seed, which is pretty good honestly based off his resume and Big Ten finish, and his lower level losses were definitely balanced out by his very top tier wins. Only problem is the 7th seed was Austin DeSano of Iowa, so they would once again wrestle in the second round, and that is exactly what happened. DeSano would win again to go on to the quarters, but RBY really closed the gap, and that match was much more competitive, and it started the trend of RBY putting his arm behind his back, which was comically smart the first time I saw it. After this loss, Penn State needed RBY to bounce back, and he did exactly that. His first match of the morning of day two, he would get tough Cornell starter and 9 seed Tucker, who got upset in day one. He would defeat Tucker and then get revenge on Thorne of Purdue. This would set up a round of 12 matchup between Philippia Pitt, who is the only man to beat Day and Fix that regular season, and RBY, who would knock him off to become an All-American. RBY would take some freshman lumps throughout the remainder of the NCAA tournament, especially on bottom, with longtime Missouri starter Ernst beating him 10-0, and then notorious Minnesota tough rider Lezak would give RBY another loss in the 7th place match to end his freshman campaign with him taking 8th. Overall, I don't think many people saw this coming. Of course, he was a 10 seed, so that might be easy to say, but he also took some weird losses in the year that I mentioned throughout this video, but in classic Penn State fashion, he peaked at the right time to start his legacy right for Penn State. This field was loaded, by the way, so placing anywhere on this stand was very impressive. Sir, Syriano and Fix would have their mega long finals match, with Syriano winning his first national title and Rutgers first national title along with it. Big Ten stuns like Meechich of Michigan and Pletcher of Ohio State, and of course we can't forget Austin of St. Iowa, would all place at this tournament as well. Other guys that didn't place were Tariq Wilson of North Carolina State, who took third the year before, Cora Myers, who would eventually become an All-American in his career, Tucker, who I previously mentioned, would have an undefeated season following this one, and then there was of course Bridges of Wyoming, who also All-American in his career along with plenty other guys that i'm just not mentioning right now but you guys get the gist there were several all americans who didn't even place in this bracket Entering his sophomore year, RBY would once again be the guy at 133 for the Nittany Lions. But the only question was, how much better would he have looked, and what was his development in his offseason, especially at 133 looking tougher than ever. I can't forget to mention that 133 would add Seth Gross back into the field after taking a medical redshirt and at a new home, Wisconsin, along with Sebastian Rivera who would bump up to 133 to really increase the stock of the weight class. However, unlike last year where RBY was an outsider looking in, who just made the push to All-American, he was now a stud at this weight class, only losing twice on the year and beating some super high-level guys. He would be 15-0 entering the gross match in Wisconsin, and this match was wild to say the least. RBY would hold up the so close sign with his fingers, and to be honest, that little gesture kind of set it all perfectly. He is that close to being a national championship level guy, and he's made some serious strides in the past off season. Secretly though, this loss was a blessing in disguise because it put him on the bottom side of the Big Ten bracket, and Rivera and Gross were on the top side. However, longtime rival Austin Asano will be on the same side as RBY, along with come up Alvarez of Rutgers. RBY would have a somewhat competitive, funky match with Alvarez in the quarterfinals, but he would win and set up another Austin DeSano rematch. It is key to note that RBY did wrestle DeSano during the year and was winning and put DeSano on his back, but DeSano would hurt his knee pretty bad and would injury default, so I guess that doesn't really count. This semifinal did though, with RBY finally changing the tide in the rivalry, winning 3-2. He would not become a Big Ten champ with Rivera knocking him off in the finals, and Rivera's career is a story in itself, so I'll stick to the RBY details. RBY was set to be the 5 seed at Nationals, setting up a Philippi vs RBY quarterfinal rematch at the 2020 NCAAs, but we all know that that event got cancelled unfortunately, so we never got to see how RBY would have done, but he would be named a first team All-American. But now the sky was the limit for RBY, and he really had a target on his back, especially with Seth Gross being gone and Rivera going up to 141. However, Dane Fix would return during the 2021 season, and he would enter the field assuming to be the favorite to win it all. However, RBY had another thing to say about that. This season was of course short, so he would only wrestle Big Ten opponents, but he was still undefeated, beating Big Ten guys like Canada Northwestern, who had also All-American this year, along with DeSano of Iowa once again, to win his first Big Ten championship. Also key to note that RBY's neutral game has really evolved over these past three years, and he is just super entertaining to watch. It's almost like someone's dancing out there. 
or we want to knock up ACC studs like Hayes of Virginia in the quarterfinals to once again All-American and outplace himself from his freshman year. He would then beat ACC champ Myers of Virginia Tech to make his way into his first ever national finals. I would like to say re-watching his freshman year matches to now, he's clearly made some major jumps, well, duh, but his maturity and movement were easily the biggest things I noticed that he developed and grew on. The 133 NCAA final was set. We would see Dayton Fix of Oklahoma State finally going up against Roman Bravo Young of Penn State. This 133 NCAA final would start the night for the 2021 finals, and it did not disappoint, and I honestly did not see the match going down the way it did. RBY would ride out Dayton Fix to get a riding time point, but after a few pushouts, the ref would ding RBY with another stalling call, which tied the match up, setting us into overtime. And this had the fans going crazy. However, overtime did change much for RBY, as he would still do his thing getting a nice takedown to knock Dane Fix out of another national championship, and this would be his second overtime loss in the finals in his career. This match was intense, especially as a Penn State fan, and the raw emotion from RBY was great. He really came a long way from placing 8 to now being a national champ in just two years, showing that Penn State really does develop these top-tier guys to another level, and they game plan better than anyone else in the country. This season looks very much the same with RBY and Dayton Fix being very dominant and being the front runners this season. Fix is coming off a world silver medal, basically at the same weight class, 61 kilograms, and RBY has definitely made some more jumps, and sometimes it seems like he can almost score at will. However, entering into this weekend, we will see another matchup between Austin and Santa of Iowa and RBY at Penn State as Penn State travels to the hostile Carver Hawkeye Arena. And like always, I cannot wait to see this match, and I cannot imagine it not being fun. RBY is currently 10-0 on the air, with his best win probably being over McGee of Arizona State, who is also a returning All-American who has looked super dominant this year as well. And RBY beat Ragason during the Michigan duel last weekend, so RBY does not seem to be showing signs of slowing down. Wow, what an incredible career by Rowan Bravo Young so far, and I can't wait to see what comes next for this Nittany Lion. Thanks again to Tanner of True Tan Wrestling for coming on to explain Rowan Bravo Young's full career and give the full backstory if you enjoyed this video make sure you hit that like button and check out tanner's videos on true tan wrestling thanks for watching